Hello, I'm Barbara Cole, Artistic Director of Just Buffalo Literary Center. As always, we begin by acknowledging that we are situated on the traditional land of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. We wish to honor the sovereignty of the Six Nations, the Mohawk, Cayuga, Onondaga, Oneida, Seneca, and Tuscarora, and acknowledge the treaties that were made on these territories. We know that we cannot correct the many wrongs of the far and recent past, but at Just Buffalo, we pledge to work toward partnership with a spirit of reconciliation and healing for present and future generations. This acknowledgement feels especially fitting this season as we focus on the body, health, and healing. Tonight, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce poet, essayist, and conceptual video artist, Dawn Lundy Martin, who is coming to us from the University of Pittsburgh, where she holds the Toy Derricotte Endowed Chair of African American Poetry. Martin is the author of four books of poetry, Goodstock Strange Blood, winner of the 2019 Kingsley Tufts Award for Poetry, Life in a Box is a Pretty Life, which won the Lambda Literary Award for Lesbian Poetry, Discipline, which was selected by Fanny Howe for the Nightboat Books Poetry Prize, and A Gathering of Matter, A Matter of Gathering, which won the Cave Canem Prize. She holds an MA from San Francisco State and a PhD from UMass Amherst. With Erica Hunt, Martin edited Letters to the Future, Black Women Radical Writing. And with Terence Hayes, she founded the Center for African American Poetry and Poetics at Pitt. Her numerous collaborations include a conceptual architecture project, the libretto for a video installation opera featured in the Whitney Biennial, and she's a founding member of the performance art and poetry group, the Black Took Collective. As an activist, Martin co-founded the Third Wave Foundation, advocating for feminism, racial justice, and LGBTQ rights to protect the lives and freedoms of women and girls. Her writing dares to stare down racial and sexual violence in all its forms and manifestations. In Life in a Box is a Pretty Life, we read of war and rape, lynching and bodies on a boat. There's blood and suffering at gunpoint. Everything feels drenched in illusion, haunted by history. What exactly is happening remains unclear. Is it disease? Is there a diagnosis? Or is it a nation rotting under the pressure of various oppressions too numerous to name? Her most recent book, Good Stock, Strange Blood, picks up this thread. Martin writes in the prologue, quote, I can't think about how to exist now without pressing together big pasts and small pasts. Big pasts like historical collective trauma and the narrow self-indulgent past of personal invasion, self-configuration at the hands of another, the mutation of blood. The book's genesis as a libretto is most notable in its sound play, words begging to be held in the mouth, savored on the tongue. In one poem, split becomes spilled, topple becomes topped, strain becomes stained, becomes strangled, becomes stoked. We hear silenced voices in the sh of sheath, shut, shades, shrink. Seemingly simple lines such as we wait in wings with its breathy repetition of wah sounds, evoking the reverberation of wings whirring on the wind as much as the echo of weight weighing the wings down, underscoring that nothing is simple. In Martin's hands, words carry the weight of history even as they lift off the page. Her use of white space is particularly notable. Halfway through the collection, readers confront a single sentence centered on the page. The whites are calling themselves border police. Here we see in the starkest terms, the black text enclosed, boxed in by the border. How the poem embodies resistance, inhabiting the white space it pushes against. This is poetry as activism. This is poetry in action, building beauty in defiance of brutality. Hello, Dawn. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Of course, thank you. Just as we began with the land acknowledgement, I feel it's also necessary to acknowledge that this conversation has been taped in advance. I'm very aware that our viewers will be watching this on the heels of election day. And whatever happens with the election, 
I wonder if we might begin our conversation by thinking about the relationship between poetry and political activism. I don't think that poetry in and of itself can do the same work as social activism. I think that um, there's a radical difference between um, you know, working on policy changes or marching in the streets or um, you know, collecting money from your neighbors and going out and feeding, say, your uh, uh, neighbors who don't have as many resources. Um, there's a radical difference between you know, work like that where change is actually made in the world in a tangible way. And I think the work that poetry does, which is I think the poetry is really about a kind of discursive um, intervention. Because it, you know, it, it enters individuals in a particular way um, and um, it affects the individual in whatever way, sometimes in a really unnameable way, in a way that one can't necessarily put language to. Um, and then, you know, the reader or the listener sits with that experience of encountering language that is about something that matters to them and to the, to the writer. Um, but the change is rather incremental, I think, and I think it's a change that has to do with how poetry contributes to the meaning making of the world as all language does, right? So um, I, I'm really hesitant that, to say that, you know, that poetry has the same or analogous kind of, um, is analogous to the social change work that I do in another part of my life, um, which is sometimes about advocacy, which is sometimes about um, you know, helping a particular organization lobby for uh, some policy change or um, uh, working in philanthropy, uh, et cetera. Um, I, I just think you know, it, th there is um, a relationship between the two kinds of social enterprises. Um, but again, I'm hesitant to say that poetry is activism. As I'm, I'm actually hesitant to say that art is activism, except I guess when um, activists use art in say a, um, a political way intentionally. Um, when um, in Chile, when the women were organizing around sexual violence and they made the whole protest into also a performance piece, that was really powerful. If you remember those red hands, um, the, the paint, red painted hands over the uh, mouths of the women, right? That's a really powerful thing. Um, but again, you know, I think that there are ways that poetry and art can kind of collude in the social change happening, but they work in very different ways to me. Absolutely. I, I certainly appreciate the distinction, and, and we among our staff were constantly having conversations about um, the difference between sort of like the work that we're doing as a literary center and how we can kind of, I think we just keep striving to do more and more and to have more direct action, um, but certainly um, as, as you mentioned, there's, there's certain artworks or books that I think can launch a conversation or raise a level of awareness um, in a way that, um, uh, that is unique and, and that some people might be resistant to sort of traditional protests, but their art has a way of opening people's minds um, and opening their hearts to hear a message that maybe they wouldn't have known they were so responsive to or, or receptive to. Um, so before we talk anymore, I wonder if you would be, I'd like to invite you to share your work and hear a little bit of, of your beautiful poetry. I will do that. Thank you. I'm going to read from Good Stock, Strange Blood, which is um, a book that crosses many terrains, I guess. It's a book that um, is part journaling, part libretto, part um, poems that look like poems that have titles, poems that don't look like poems at all. Um, and 
it has these section titles as well. Um, I'll begin with the first section called the baby book. And this occurs after the prologue, which if I have time, I might come back to. A glow, this bent body, itch of layer, knot of hair, they call us Negro. To stand broad-footed in sensation of being lit up. No monument, only blood earth, warm salve to open throat bone. How to live between mother and time. As if born into the self, watching the self already made formless than out of clay. Feel the hump of our drape. Hear the body, flesh, inevitable, unsatiated hunger like a whip, instrumental fissure, instrumental fish, whose rasp, a whip, a book, a story left in the dark body. To reach fingers out toward shine of morning, eyes squinted and find there only cord grass, some smoke or a warning. He said, if they would only just beat or shoot me, but they wanted soul substance to harbor that like that so I could never move from this place. They reach cracked, crackled, cracked hands inside and hold me open for raking. Our name, our name, what is our name? Where are the buttons holding us in place? What is place outside of time? Outside of memory, unstitched, unsnatched, swell into our mother's, quote, blackened skin, her, quote, tarnished, quote, whiteness, her rope shackled to grandfather's black neck. A picket, a thicket, rice, cotton, sugar, potatoes, cow peas, turnips, and rye. Oh, Lord, thank you, Mr. Hopeton, not selling my boy. This is the body bending over another. Textures, we know them. Textures, we know them. Bruises, our Mrs. homespun cape. Linen hung by its lips sway. A useless body, trash boy. What is a dance for being? A step toward nothingness, gray landscape, purple feet. I remember, I swear, the limp relative to nothing. Scraps, bright against sea, migrant legs almost drowned already, a narrative wired in cells, desolate root. We succumbed, we succumbed head by measure, by weight of black sheath and organs, legacy that lingers, a hip thrust. We wait in wings, expanse spread across darkening blue sky. We shut shades, huff into wings, shrink bones of self, what you drag, your banjo, your braided necklace disappearance into mole, stink of flesh become flesh. Come now, arms and arches open to pocket all dejected souls. My form against those at the border, arbitrary line, perish, knocking among other refugees. The islands, no one there to help, thousands buried by water, a butchered animal at my feet, wolves howl, soot falls from sky. The rescuers are never prepared and we here amid a failure of images, scrub a spot whiter than before, demarcate before there's nothing left. Breathe into white sand, the dead ache so. 
So I lied before when I said I was reading from the baby book. That was not the baby book. I decided to start at the beginning. Um, now I'll read from the baby book. To be in covering is the problem. Hunger cabins under this leather wrap from destitution, from split skull, mother as brown as, brawn and braided toward filth beneath, skin like wire, all our kin from before it happened when dust underfoot, red dick stuck under guise of reason, who summons us from darkness, from water well one philtrum stitch to wool of tongue. Who tugs and rocks us, suckles wet mouth. We is the purpose of the falling, swollen, our teeth hurt, their constant cutting, warm when sunken, wanted the swell of black earth, a legacy, something larger than ourselves to hold us. If we were looking from the outside, if we were looking from the outside, I'd think a thing ancient would not pulse so loudly, would be automatically removed from the atmosphere, lose its atomic structure, its relatability. We were driven or we were rode hard, mule-like on feathers, the, this notion of sustainability, black vultures everywhere, neat white stars under wings, good at cleaning up road carcasses. What a mess mess your weak veins, your lifelong addictions. What you then must witness is the vulture devouring the exposed red and fly-soaked, unrecognizable. The book, the book of repression, the book of repression, of repression. All the stuff brilliantly cocking my throat, no dream remembered, no past reconstructed. He called it a kiss, but that was no kiss. Rises, dead breath into smoke. The writing is not bomb. The eye in sleep is unreachable. Subtle flesh, skin warm milk, salt marsh, its simplicity without warning. In my early 30s, I had one dream so vivid it began to feel like a memory rather than a dream. It's the only dream worth recounting. At some point, I no longer held the dream, just the memory of the dream told, and often I'd get confused as to the nature of non-dreamed life. In a giant old abandoned house at the top of a hill, it's night and I'm furtively burying a man's body under some floorboards. I pull up the floorboards and then I'm outside digging a grave with, with my hands. It's easy, this digging, and I know there will be no evidence, no evidence of this activity. I'm free to carve out soil in big rough scoops. Even though I know I won't get caught, my body is racked with guilt, but I cannot stop. The burial is necessary and compelled, so I scrape the earth, bludgeon it with bloody fingers, then place his body into the shallow grave, replacing the floorboards no one will ever know. Elision, elision into vowels, sunken time, O oh, sounds, ah, Oh, short, flat, ah, for as long as. My brother bends away from the hose that beats him. Basement is a watery place. I think of privacy and houses, what they allow for their intimacy of enclosure. We never heard a word from over there and they never heard a word from us. How the home seals off the world creates a hole in the world and there is no joy in that. To watch a teenage boy compress and the heart still beats, compressed and the heart still beats, is hiss, is hiss, is what hatred made. God will not save you. A last leaf under cover. Three days in bed. You think hurry and get to the real black bits or no one will care. You have no sage advice. You are no magic black. There's no head to rub. I play a game. I'm living a normal life in utter aloneness, fossil of aloneness. When I slice off a chunk of my finger with the sharpest knife, wonder if anyone in town will be up for a fuck. 
the book is not writing itself in the chilled gray day. No one, no one will admit the facts of the matter even though logbooks provide the material. They look at gloves and say, gloves, that's it. And you are hoisted up on stretcher, paraded through crowded streets, contortion of hacked body. Green grass, green grass, green grass, green grass, green grass grows. Only I see my stranger to split, to be spilled, to topple, to, to be topped, to strain, be stained, strangled. Robe falls open against my belly, stroked. Black stars fill up black sky. Black stars fill up black sky, a dark stairwell up two flights to shag rug. I will lie here for a long time. I will be unspectacular and limp. When the opal stone appears, I'll lean into it, but terror is a runaway train. Is deer head left on side of road, those gentle deer eyes staring softly at nothing. If the stone works at all, it's easy to catapult my body up the gymnasium rope knot by knot, a willowy thing until relief under billowing fragrance of the parachute, all our little forms cross-legged in wonder. When I stand now at the edge of the earth, night close and tight around me, no difference between what was undreamed and what happened. For example, my stranger ever beckoning, dark-eyed and grinning, or is it me who dislodges packed dirt from the hole the earth made? Symptomatic of being a slave is to forget you're a slave, to participate in industry as a critical piece in its motor. At night, you fall off the wagon because it's like falling into yourself. I call for my stranger. I long for him. I, I look for him in the face of every black ghost on the edge of every piss-stinking park. Can taste Bacardi breath, the long toe of it lapping against skin, pressure in what can't happen and does, an imprint. How the slender living room window looks out onto the street, a sofa perpendicular to window in front of TV. The kitchen table for Micah, my feet dangling. Or was it from the motel that one time? Who allows, who doesn't say wait? into a room full of bicycles where the children fetch their toys. A thing you don't want can make you ravenous, can open the sturdiest lip with its faint presence. The proposition that compels the book. The proposition that compels the book is already flawed, hovering somewhere between memory and fantasy, repetition and desperation. I know how you'll cock your head. You'll ask, what is memory? But what I mean is that any existence inside of both loss and abundance feels impossible. You can't have your cake and eat it too. Don't rob Peter to pay Paul. Somehow after all these years, I'm still alive. I cannot stand to exist against the banal. I'd rather be a monster than live inside of your cereal box. And I was a monster, wasn't I? Did I grin when you suffered? An estimation of justice. The night in question how an infection entered my pussy and got hold. Like you, I'm unforgiving. It might be a perversion of my blood inherited like a sore. What language my grandmother spoke, I cannot tell you. On the census records from 1903, the word laborer. My mother is crippled and I will live in her place a stain in the hegemony. Thank you so much for that powerful reading, Dawn. I'm so glad that you read the proposition that compels the book. It feels like such a pivotal moment in the book, almost a hinge or puncture moment, particularly in its tone, which I read as markedly different from what comes before. 
There's so much going on in this poem. The tension between cock your head and the infected pussy, the role of inheritance or legacy with the grandmother and mother, the estimation of justice and the stain and hegemony. I'm not even sure what my question is. Maybe I just wanna say, talk to me about this poem. At what point in the process of writing the collection did you compose it? And how do you understand how this poem operates in the larger manuscript? The poem, I'm going to look down at it a little bit, um, but there's, um, there's a thread throughout the book that's kind of like this um, critique of the project of the book. Um, for me, I see, especially in my last three books, as really um, kind of the, they're extensions of the same project. Um, there's this other meta thing happening throughout in a similar way that's both about the book and also about the way in which our culture calls for certain kinds of black representation. And so the, this manuscript is really pushing against that in a way um, that's both oblique and direct um, and, you know, kind of at that metacognitive level. Um, kind of commenting on the thing itself. Um, and so that's, this is a part of that. The proposition that compels the book is already flawed. It's already hovering someplace between memory and fantasy. It's also really, um, it's, it's almost a joke when I say, you ask, I know you'll cock your head and say, what is memory? That's kind of you know, tongue in cheek because memory when it comes to um, African American life is often a kind of, known set of signifiers and representations. Um, I also want to push against that. I think that the narratives of black life in this country are way more complicated than that certain set of signifiers that we're often drawn to, both as black people, but I think also, when I say culture, I'm talking about the institutions that make up culture. Um, so that's where that, poem's be that's where that poem begins. Um, and, um, and then it just goes into a kind of um, uh, um, um, formal experiment in um, parataxis. So um, to, I'll let you in on a little secret, which is that um, I'm, I'm writing about um, a past relationship in this, in this moment in the middle, but also about how um, trauma, my own personal trauma of sexual violence is breathing up through that relationship. Um, so I leave the other, you know, the kind of commentary and I'm like, well, this is what I really want to write about as a black female-ish subject um, in this particular moment. Um, and then if we return to this question of legacy, you know, what's remembered, um, I get to this point where I'm talking about my own personal legacy, my mother, my grandmother, what's known, what's not known, et cetera. Um, but it's, you know, it kind of filtered through my own body, my own um, lack of knowledge. Um, that's the story of this poem. Thank you. That feel, it, it reads so powerfully. I think that that's conveyed whether it's explicit or not. And, and there's a number of times when you push against, as you say, there's sort of the, like, the meta narratives that you're pushing against representations um, as black lives is like one kind of narrative or one thing. I love at one point you write, the problem of the book is that it's never quite black enough. The black bits will be excisable, quotable in reviews. Um, and I'm, I'm curious as to know, I mean, I think it's also important to note that this book, you really grapple with racialized language. You know, you're, you're using the term Negro, the term black, blackness, the N-word. Um, how do you consciously resist those sorts of reductive readings or a selective approach to language where, where critics or reviewers um, or interviewers are going to sort of like try to pull the black bits out. How do you make sure that that complexity remains intact? 
I mean, it is in the book, right? I can't control necessarily what the reviewer does or the person writing about the book. And in truth, those moments are often, even given the, um, the critique of that mode, um, excised and quoted. So, <laughs> and it's kind of like, What's easiest for people to latch on to when it comes to blackness becomes blackness, I will just say in quotes in this moment, becomes like the thing that is, you know, the most recognizable bit or sometimes the most, um, the bit that's more uh, salacious, I would say, um, in terms of the way that a black person might deal with blackness. Um, the word black, I think, is probably the most used word in the book, maybe, if I were to guess. And it's used in a lot of different ways. So um, by the time you get to the end of the book, my hope is that black becomes something other than what you entered the book thinking about the symbolic nature of black or blackness. Um, just to say any word over and over again kind of disassociates a person from that word, right? Even a word like belt can become abstract in its repetition. Um, so that's part of what's happening here, I think, is that, um, you know, there are a lot of black birds. There, you know, there's a lot of black everything. So um, in this interweaving and... Um, overlapping and repetition and shifting of what black is attending to, I hope to both um, disassociate the reader from their normative sense of regular sense of what blackness is or might be, and to also, um, but to not leave behind at the same time the, um, the condition of blackness that um, you know, black people uh, experience worldwide, right? So it's not as if it's one thing or the other, it's both, both and. Um, there's this poem that I never read, but I'm gonna read it because if you don't mind, it's the Father and Dead, Lo Father and Dead Logs poem. And I'm going to read it because um, it's just grappling with my father's, my actual father's um, own predicament of, of blackness without naming it as such. Father in dead logs. My father eating a plate of boiled okra. False teeth, rungs clacking. Him drinking a plate of beers, him large and dim on crackling skins or fat from pickled pigs. Him saving me from choking on an ice cube, picking too many strawberries with me in a field slunk down drunk in the back seat of the Buick, me steadily driving, me driving steadily, the road almost on fire with no eyes, my father glowing under white gazes, shining like a fucking flaccid ninja, them rocky parents in the front seat, them cussing with barely cuss words, them working on all fours all the time, time passing like a dragon, cosmos winking at us according to blanched root to fragrant history, come up, come round and come up, invisible with bright teeth. Um, the moment that strikes me as being a part of this conversation is my father, I mean, it's all kind of leading up to this moment, my father glowing under white gazes, shining like a fucking ninja. Um, you know, life is complicated for black people. The weight of, of life that produces his particular kind of black subjectivity, his particular relationship to blackness, which was you know, there's a moment, I think, in, um, in uh, my book, Discipline, where I'm writing about my father. And he's talking about the crime in the neighborhood and that it is, it's the niggers who did it. <laughs> you know, something like a racist white man would say. <laughs> anyway, I mean, this is, 
I want to I, I want to be honest about you know the experience both of my family and as you know so in order to I think have true resistance and this is not that I'm saying that my book is going to do this or that my work does this but I think to be to to truly resist the system of systems of oppression that um, are racist and sexist and homophobic etc um, that patriarchal you know the c capitalist you know all of that colluding in a kind of gigantic, invisible system, almost, that brings us to our knees, that we also have to tell the complicated truth about what it means to be a black subject, right? To a black person in social space, um, or any person in social space. Um, yeah. I don't know if that answered your question or not, because um, I just started talking, and then, <laughs> then I just got off of my own ideas. <laughs> I actually appreciate that you're not trying to necessarily offer answers because I think it's so clear that, that uh, we are not in a position, I'm speaking like we as Americans, we are not in a position to feel like we have it figured out. I you know, was really struck, I noted earlier that our theme for the series, the studio series this fall is the body health and healing. And you know, of course we can't have a conversation in America about bodies without grappling honestly with how black bodies and brown bodies are treated um, and the kind of ongoing oppression that is um, met on black and brown bodies. Uh, you write in the prologue, as I was writing this book, it was the summer of Sandra Bland and the summer of Freddie Gray, and then some cute kid was shot in a big box store while holding a toy gun, and so many other of these deaths unexplained in the logics of the rationality we hold so dear, and the white boys are hand slapped for brutal rapes. Life just goes on. The past isn't the past, but the present. And for me, one of the painful truths in this notion that the past isn't the past, but the present, is that the book feels hyper-relevant, whether it's the, you know, in the wake of Sandra Bland and Freddie Gray, um, or we could say in the summer of Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor and George Floyd, just as it would feel painfully relevant in the summer of Michael Brown or the winter of Trayvon Martin. Um, I want to ask something about the future and how do we possibly break this pattern, but I don't wanna be naive because we're talking about 400 years at least of this type of oppression. I have no idea. I mean, I, <laughs> I think that, um, I, I wanna say, Three things, I think. One is, I think that um, yes, this is this is um, this is what you know. Racial violence and racial subjugation is what this country was built on. It's what can, this country continues to be built on. Um, it's not as if um, you know the past is always breathing up through the present. I think, but it's just an ongoing situation when it comes to the devaluation of black people um, and the reduction of black people to animals. When I watched the George, George Floyd video, I actually happened to be um, texting with Terrence Hayes uh, about something. And he sent me a video that he had made and I had just watched that. Um, with one of his poems and then I was writing something and I decided to look at the video um, of George Floyd being murdered which I hadn't looked at yet and I just put my head down on my desk and cried for five minutes because the it was as if he didn't exist already um, this is a kind of cultural discursive thing woven into our uh, beings as Western people um, that black people aren't really human, right? So to, for you could see it in the cop's face that he had no sense really that this was a person. Um, so this is, this is just, you know, so 
I'm going to say something that actually counters what I was saying earlier about, or maybe it just extends it about when you asked me the question about art and activism. I do think that what needs to change alongside, you know, the direct action stuff like policy, you know, training cops, like whatever, is it possible? We'll see. But the thing that needs to change is our, as a culture, our interior spaces, like what we as people um, feel and um, think about other people. And I think that it's involuntary, you know? I think that uh, racism on some part, on some people's part is like, you know, um, an, an active choice, but the way that it's woven into our culture is not necessarily an active choice. So how do we dissemble that? And I do think actually, that art and poetry and language has some role to play in that. Because it's when we, and I'll just talk about language right now, when we reinvent language, and I steal this in, all the time from my friend Erica Hunt, um, when, we, when we reinvent language and reorder it outside of its normal syntactical ways of making meaning, we create new kinds of meaning. Um, and I think that um, we, we understand things we didn't understand before. So, you know, through the reordering and restructuring of language. And I, th I believe that, um, that that helps us to know things differently, but it also helps us to, to incrementally begin to create the world that we want to live in, right? Um, it, it's about you know, something that's almost impossible to access in the immediate moment. Um, but if I think about the things that um, saved my life and changed my life, I will say that um, it's about both literature, but it's also about accessing the creative act. Um, and you know, I've said this before in interviews, so uh, I'll, I'll say it in a different way, but, you know, I was once um, on a panel interviewing my friend and poet Carl Phillips, and he said that poetry saved his life. Um, and poetry has also saved my life because it was through writing, through reading and writing, um, that, I, that I was actually able to grapple with in whatever way I was doing it as a young person, with the sexual violence that had happened in my life as a young person. I didn't even know that's what I was doing, you know? I just was kind of doing this thing. I hadn't never met a poet or, you know? <laughs> I didn't know that poets existed in like real life. <laughs> so, um, but it was the thing that really um, was healing for me in a way where I didn't have to then, you know, jump off a bridge. I could do something to address in whatever way being creative does, the, 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 the trauma that I was grappling with and didn't even know it. Um, so I do think that there's a role for literature to play and for poetry to play and for art to play in that cultural aspect that everyone finds so difficult to grapple with. How do we change culture? How do we change culture? Um, it, you know, it's important for um, the, this moment and every moment here henceforward to really um, put as much out there in the world that is unlike something that's been produced before so that our thinking changes. I so appreciate your candor, and, and actually, I think this is the perfect segue. You talking about poetry saving your life. I think in a lot of, in a lot of ways, we think about, we have a, um, a writing center here for teens, and we think so much about the teens who come here or come to us virtually in this moment um, as providing that awareness that, oh, a poet is a thing in the real world. Like these are living, breathing people, writers and poets right now. I want to connect to um, one of our amazing youth ambassadors who comes to the Writing Center in Zynga has this question for you. 
Hi, Don. I'm Nzinga Cameron from Buffalo, New York. And I was just wondering how your navigation through the world as a Black lesbian in America impacted, influenced, and motivated your writing and your work and what it has become. You know, weirdly, I came out late. So I came out when I was like 22. Um, and I had just moved to the Bay Area. I actually moved there with my boyfriend. <laughs> and he was following me. He was actually following me out there. So I got out about two weeks before he arrived. And um, I, by the time he got there, I was out to myself. Um, but I, say, I tell that story just to say that my coming out process, because I, was I happened to be just surrounded by this amazing community of queer women of color in Oakland, that I just felt really um, held by that community um, within this other like weird progressive community that is, you know, the Bay Area, Oakland, San Francisco, Berkeley. Um, so um, I was super lucky. When it comes to my work, I think that um, being queer, I mean, a lesbian is really such a, it's almost an archaic term. I feel like I'm a dying breed, but uh, <laughs> the last of the lesbians. <laughs> but, um, but um, you know, uh, when it comes to my work, being queer, what it does is it really, um, it makes gender operate really differently, I think, in the work. Um, and it makes pronouns really weird and slippery. Um, it contributes to that. There's another thing that contributes to that, but the, my gender and my sexual orientation um, becomes a thing that's attended to in the poems as a kind of something that breathes up through them and is dispersed across them as opposed to something that's directly attended to. Um, it doesn't need to be that for me, um, especially given the context of my, you know, like radical situation in, in the Bay Area uh, with these amazing uh, dykes of color. Here, here, I'm not a dying breed at all, I, I would say. It seems like uh, we have so many students that, that we see sort of grappling with coming out and um, that's so beautiful, that notion of the community holding you in that space and in that moment. We have another excellent question here. This question is from Richie Wills. Hello, my name is Richie. I'm an immigrant, I'm queer. I'm also a writer and a poet. And my question today is um, regarding experimental poetry because I'm very interested in that realm. As an experimental poet and experimental artist and performer, what role do you believe experimental art plays in changing narratives? That's such an interesting question. You know, I am, um, I used to be a person, and for a long time, really, I wrote my dissertation on um, experimental poetry, something that I was calling experimental poetry. And I wrote it on subjectivity, experimental poetry, and, um, and for women of color poets. Um, and uh, I say that to say that I was really interested in designating something as experimental and something as conventional. I, when I look at the contemporary, like broad range of poetics at work right now in the contemporary moment, um, I'm not that interested in saying that something is experimental and something isn't experimental. I think that, there are exper that experiment really is a process as opposed to a production, um, as opposed to the product. So that um, the way that I approach ex experimentalism now is not necessarily in what's produced, it's in how you get there. So to think about the process of writing as a process um, of work in a laboratory where you're trying things out, screwing things up, failing tremendously, bringing in outside elements, um, turning the poem upside down in order to get to some really unique place in the work. 
Um, if I were to answer the question more directly, I would say that the experiment, another way of thinking about what, what's experimental and what's not experimental and the work of experimental, experimental poems is, I think that, uh, like I was saying before, that when language and syntax and form are made unordinary, that it produces something new when it comes to knowledge for both the writer and the uh, reader. So I think it's important for poetry to really resist ways of speech that are normative, including the sentence itself. Um, even when operating, say, in a sonnet, to make that sonnet so that it's like a sonnet like you've never experienced before, um, I think is important to making, like as he said, um, it was, um, it creates new narratives. Like that, that experimental product also creates new narratives. Well, that's actually a perfect segue. Um, this is another question from one of our youth ambassadors. This is Ellie's question. And she asks, what inspires your writing form? Do you begin writing knowing that your ideas will take the form of a poem or essay, or does it reveal itself to you through the process? I just have to, when it comes to genre, uh, whether or not something is an essay or whether or not something is um, a poem, it's just an intentional thing. Like I, I know when I'm writing an essay because it's a different kind of imaginative process. And I have to say, I'm writing an essay today. It doesn't just come to me. I'm working on this essay because here's the way that I want to tell this story. Um, if I want to tell stories that are, um, I'm, I'm working on some autobiographical essays right now that I hope will become a book. Um, and when I'm attending to that, I'm actually attending to a lot of the same stories that I've written in my poems, but in a really different way. Um, it's a kind of exorcism doing that work in more than one genre. Um, and it's a choice. I just say, today I'm going to work on this in an essay form. Um, if I'm thinking about the poem and the forms the poems take, I often also start with the formal constraint as opposed to, here is what I want to write in this poem. Sometimes I start the poem thinking, I'm going to write a poem that looks like this. And then I have to figure out what kind of speaking is allowed within that particular constraint. Say it's a square. I want the poem to look like a square for whatever reason. So then I have to think about the way that the form and the content are working up against and with each other. And then what I'm writing about is actually revealed to me as opposed to um, coming to the poem always with an idea of what the poem is gonna say. I love that. So we're coming up to the end of our time together. Um, are you up for a lightning round of some really quick questions and quick answers? Yes. Do you describe yourself as a morning person or night owl? Oh my God, a night owl. When I have to wake up in the morning, I feel like I'm gonna die, like if it's before 10. <laughs> I feel you completely, yes. Okay, what's your dream job? I'm doing it. <laughs> uh, my dream job is being a poetry professor, but also I love running the Center for African American Poetry and Poetics. It is, it brings together all of my interest in this moment. I feel really lucky. I love that. What's your guilty pleasure? <laughs> oh my God, I have so many. <laughs> Should I say, Smoking an evening American spirit, or <laughs> should I say, they're organic, by the way, not the others. Or should I say, um, watching The Bachelorette? Oh, I love a little <laughs> trash TV. I'm with you on that. <laughs> Trashy um, television? Yeah, something you've learned about yourself during the pandemic. I've learned that I'm really good at staying in my house and not moving. Um, I've learned that um, I really like stillness more than I thought I did. Uh, for the first two months of the pandemic, I did almost nothing. I read a little, um, I went on some walks, but I had like no goals. 
And it was such a relief. And I was like, oh, I'm kind of just like, even though I was born a per poor person, I think I, you know, must have been a, 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 an aristocrat of some sort, some kind of prince or something at some point in another life. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Okay, last question. You know, so much of our conversation and this moment focuses on really heavy topics. Um, but I'd like to just end by asking, where do you find joy in these trying times? I find joy in community. I think that um, community is really necessary, even if you can't be in physical space with community, but coming together in whatever ways you can with people um, brings me a lot of joy. Even if, you know, it's a socially distanced thing for an hour or two, you know, or whatever, I think that um, community is not only joyful, but it's um, sustaining. Like it sustains, I think, our, 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 our spiritual life or does me um, to be around people in whatever way possible that I love and who inspire me and who inspire my imagination. Also karaoke. Well, I love both those forms of joy. Thank you so much for sharing your, your work with us today, taking the time to bring us um, some, some joy and inspiration as we think through how we as a community can keep working to do better. Thank you so much, Dawn. Thank you so much for having me. It's been such a pleasure. Um, I hope the weather gets better in Buffalo. <laughs> Thank you. The weather is, you know, we embrace it. The breeze, captive, while I've been captive, contemplating escape, free from your reign in this cage, trapped. I stepped into and snapped. Oh, love's inside. The answer is why. You like to hold things really close. I like to give the things I love the most room. You like to hold things really close. I like to give the things I love the most room. You like to hold things really close. I like to give the things I love the most room. What got bigger, the bird or the cage? What gets smarter, the heart or the brain? What gets meaner, your eyes or this leash? What's a sure thing? 